because you were there right in the mid 80s, right, right at the beginning with George Lucas, looking at Star Tours and Imagineering. Okay, that's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, look at that. So, well, that tells you it was, it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So, how, how it really came about, um, people often ask us, which comes first? You know, the, the story or the ride? And this was one of those cases where they came about the same time. In the early 80s, uh, my colleague Tony Baxter and I were sent to London to take a test ride on a motion-based simulator that was made by a company that made flight training simulators for airlines. And they wanted to get into the entertainment business. So off we went and we got into this crude cabin that had a couple of airline seats and a video projector. And they showed us some programming for a roller coaster and a race car and a motorcycle. And we got pretty ill. Um, but we realized, um, it was pretty crudely done, but we realized the potential of it. And uh, shortly after that, we came back to Imagineering, or WED, as it was called in those days, and we had invited George Lucas down to meet with us to talk about things we might do together. And obviously, between Indiana Jones and, and Star Wars, you know, he had blockbuster stories that we thought would be great for rides in our parks. So George was taking a tour through the building, and he saw a storyboard on a wall that had ideas for a motion simulator, and he said, what's that? We explained, he said, well, that would be great for Star Wars. And from that day on, we started working on the development of the show. Now for George, one of the key things was, and this is a, an early sketch of what the interior of the Star Spear would look like. George was really interested in combining uh, humor with a thrill ride, which is something he thought hadn't been done before, and he thought was, that was an interesting combination. Um, and that became sort of the, the whole start of Star Tours. I think we presented three different concepts for him for possible storylines, and he really liked the one that was like the tour company going through the universe. He thought that would give us a lot of ideas for comedy, um, which would keep it lighter and be right for Disneyland, which was the park we originally were designing for. Yeah, give it up, that's great. That's amazing. So in this early concept, this, this came from, from Imagineering, and, and of course George Lucas had his own company, uh, ILM, that you were working with as well. Yes. Uh, and, and what was that collaboration like? I mean, because the, the visuals are so incredible, the story, everything, the creative is just, just really the best. You sweat the details. They, you know, of course we were huge fans, as everyone is, of ILM and the magic that they've created. And it turns out they were huge fans of Disneyland. So it was a true love fest. Um, but it was a new, it was a new type of um, working arrangement for them. And, you know, doing shots for films, we came in and said, okay, we want to do this motion simulator ride. And they started to storyboard it out with us, and, and the first time we reviewed it, they said, now, we'll start here in the launch, and then we'll cut to a close-up of a pilot. And we said, whoa, 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 there's, there's no cutting to a close-up. This is a windshield. If you're cutting to a close-up, someone is on your windshield. And suddenly they realized they had to do essentially a four-and-a-half-minute visual effects shot which they had never done before, but they were very clever about finding ways within the original Star Tours film, it was filmed in those days, um, to hide those transition breaks so no one ever saw them. So it was, a, it was a great deal of fun. Wow, that's fascinating, right? Because it is just one continuous shot. You're not cutting from two different perspectives. And uh, I, yeah, I immediately think of the break inside the comet would be a great cutaway, for example. There was those kind of tricks. Yeah, well, you know, we eventually realized we needed to put a monitor on board so that if we had someone calling in to us, they wouldn't be calling in to us from the windshield. So we, we, we found a way to do that. Um, and eventually we, we uh, added a, a pilot um, to the original show, Rex. <laughs> and there he is. There he is. Uh, that Rex is on the right. Um, that's Chris, Chris Ronco, the designer of Rex. And that really came about because George thought we should have, we should have a droid. Actually, he thought we should have several. But he thought we should have a droid on there, and as the storyline evolved, the character of Rex really became a rookie pilot. Someone who was doing his first flight, and uh, he, had to, he had to scream a lot, as we make all of our characters in Star Tours do. And uh, that led us, way back then, to looking for a voice talent to do Rex. And, and one of my colleagues introduced me to an actor named Paul Rubens, who was doing, who was doing a lot of uh, doing his Pee Wee Herman show at the time, and he came in and he became the voice of Rex. So we had Island going, we had our, our cabin show going, but then we really had to move on to, okay, what's the rest of the story? What is the setup? What is the immersing the audience into the Star Wars world? And that led us to then focus our attentions on the pre-show, 
and to starting the story of Star Tours. And we had a very famous um, set of characters that we wanted to add into that to that story. We so and so we found a way within our story of this tour company to have R two D two and C three PO as a new character role. So I forget what I was doing at the time, but I, I ended up in your office, we'd never met, and you were on your side of the desk, and you said, so here's the story of Star Wars, or Star Tours, and all that kind of thing. And I promise you that you are such a wonderful storyteller that as you went, and then you zoomed doing it, you did all the action, all the shots, and all that kind of thing, you made it so live for me, you know, you didn't need the ride, you were a master at telling that story. And then, would I be part of the pre-show? as you can see there, uh, standing up on the gantry. And so at some point, I came to uh, Flower, Flower Boulevard. Flower Street, yeah. Flower Street. Land, yeah. And uh, they had a camera and a sandbag. And, I and then uh, there was a box or something there. And you said, I said, what's the sandbag for? He said, well, you cannot move your feet. Do you remember saying this? They had to lock <laughs> me in one position so that, um, I'm talking to R2 there, and uh, I couldn't do anything, I couldn't do any action, so they, they wanted me in one place. And uh, I said, why? And they said, you said, all the controls come up through your left leg into the animatronics, I'm totally wired. But then I, I just remembered a strange thing, because at some point you said to me, the audience are coming in down here, as they go winding up the stairs there. So they're coming and seeing all the wonderful commercials for this airline. And as they come through, could you, do you remember saying this, could you just do a look down to them and go back to your job after that? And um, so we filmed, we filmed and whatever. And it was great fun. We, we had fun with the script, you know, Artu was messing up the uh, the plane that he's re refitting there. And then um, time goes by. And before we opened, I'm suddenly by myself down there in a totally empty place, but it's all running and, and 3 goes chatting away. And as I stood there, he stops talking to R2 and just... <laughs> <laughs> My soul turned over. It was a very, very peculiar moment. And, uh, and then he just looked away again. <laughs> Did he recognize you? <laughs> he, uh, he vaguely thought he knew who I was, but, you know, he had better things to do. <laughs> was that something that you filmed, or was there a way to record those animations? Oh, well, I, I was uh, wearing jeans and a, a, a shirt, and that was it. Because you wanted to see, really, kind of how I would do it, is that right? Yeah, so we had uh, Davey Fighton, who was the programmer of the show originally, um, wanted, an, wanted a video reference so that he could get the, the animatronic figure to look as close as possible to how you would move in the film. And Dave was a superb programmer, but a man of very few words, and very tall. So I'm saying to him, uh, you do understand that 3PO is, is not a human animatronic. He's not like Pirates of the Caribbean. He's looking at me like this. That he, he kind of has a peculiar way, of, and he's still looking at me like this. And, I, and he's not saying anything. I this man is very strange. And, maybe not very bright, you know, because he's not understanding my English accent. And I explained that 3PO has his own way of moving. Eventually, when I saw that finished animatronic, I got goosebumps, because Dave is a genius. I couldn't believe that I wasn't in the costume there in, in front of the Star Speeder. He's a hero. You're surrounded by, I remember there are so many wonderful designs in the pre-show as you wind up the stairs, there are different droids, there are, there are all kinds of, like, 3PO kind of introduces you to this, almost like the backstage area of, of uh, the cargo hold, and, and yeah. So he got goosebumps, which leads me to this story, um, the goose droids. So we are um, G290 and G240. Um, and where do they come from? So we were really far along in production, and Tony Baxter said, you know, the guests are going to be waiting in this line for a long time, and it's Star Wars. We have to make sure we've got enough show all the way through. So we had this droid Gnostics Repair Center as the setting, but we didn't have enough droids. And so Tony and Chris Teets, who was our production designer, went 
overnight into an adjacent attraction known as America Sings and stole two geese from the show. They literally went to two of the barbershop quartet scenes and turned them into barbershop trios and they de-feathered them. Um, and that's how, that's why they're called um, goose droids. And uh, for the show, so we got two free figures, and uh, we figured no, you know, I, no one's gonna. It was a pre-social media, so we didn't have people saying two of our geese are missing from American Sings. But, but we got two more. We got two more droids for our show, and then we uh, had to get the tracks ready. From Skywalker was doing all the audio work for us on this, and uh, the scene I think was ten, a ten-minute loop. And so we told Skywalker, we need to have these things doing beeps and things a la R2-D2 for 10 minutes. And they said, well, we need, a, we need something to work off of. What, what are they saying? What are they doing? And we were really, really late in production. So I had to overnight write a script for the two droids just so that they could write sound, do sound effects that would make sense to it. Well, they did all this work, and George Lucas came in to review it. And while they're playing these beeps and things, he, he looks at the script on the table and says, what's this? And they said, that's the guide script for the show. And he said, well, that's what they should be saying. And he said, no, we have this week. He said, no, they should be saying these words. So now we had no time. The figures were in the field. The show was going to open. So Mike West, who was a fellow writer, and I had to go into the booth and record the dialogue for those figures. And that's what was in, been in, that was what was in the original show for years. It was never meant to be. And it was kind of a silly script, I, I can say. Um, but anyway, so I got roped into being the little droid in there, and, uh, and actually it's a role I continued in the new show. Yeah. Another, oh, that's so great. <laughs> a great day for you. Well, you, you brought up the new show. I, I want to talk about The Adventures Continue, because in 2011 when that launched, I mean, it was just such a, 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 an incredible experience running to the way. Can you tell us about that process? And of course, Anthony, you had such a, a, a large role. In well, and I remember you you turned up at the house again. You came <laughs> round and you said, uh, I want to talk about Star Tours. And you explained that it was many, many, uh, much more uh, digital and all that kind of thing, 3D and all that. And you explained the story just as you had before. And that it was going to be this and this and this and this. And then you said, but unfortunately, we had to retire Captain Rex. And I kind of thought, well, that is sad. So we need a new pilot. And that pilot is you. <laughs> I remember, I just blush. I did, I, you probably didn't notice that. I was absolutely overwhelmed. I didn't expect it at all. And I was thrilled. Thank you. That's where we. Uh, so the, how it came about was the original show was great and going on and on and on. And then George started to do the new films. And he invited us up to Lucasfilm to see the pod race. And we saw the pod race, look, you can see we're all getting older. Um, so he showed us the pod race, and we actually storyboarded it and figured we were going to do it in 3D and had it all set to go. And then we sort of stopped and said, well, wait, what's going to be in episode two? And then, of course, you can imagine the next logical question is, well, what's going to be in episode three? And then when it was all done and we looked at all six, we were saying, well, what should the sequence be that we, that we build the show on? And as you know, typical Imagineers, we said, well, why does it have to be one show? Now that we can go digital, why can't it be a branching storyline so that you never know where you're going to go? And that became the, the basis for The Adventures Continue, which is that even I don't know when I ride it what combination of scenes are going to come up. And the beauty of that, of course, is that that title allowed us to keep moving as the new movies uh, came out. So we updated uh, with a sequence from episode 7, Jakku, Jakku, and BB-8 who we love. Um, and now we're, we're deep at work, and we're at work no. uh, on something I new. Know this was a secret. <laughs> you didn't hear Tom Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> so Star Tours, a, a wonderful adventure. Star Tours, the adventures continue. And now Star Tours, the adventures continue to continue. <laughs> so no, it's, we're, we're going to crate. Crate, 
and we are deep in production with ILM right now, and I can tell you it's going to be an amazingly fun sequence for the show, so we're really excited. And you and I are recording, I think, early next month. Yes, so I have to get right in quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep the magic and do it overnight, because i got to say, you can't argue with the results when you do that. That's, that's really great. Right, give them a round of applause. Thank you.